Oh well, so yeah, I'm that's a, why you need the, your wife anyway. I do. I I need her all the time. Wow. Okay. So, I'm I'm in New Zealand. It's almost ten past five. It's in the evening. It's in winter. That's why I've got a cardigan on. But uh, our house is heated, so it's quite warm. But for me, it's very wonderful that Zoom, when it works for me, is a wonderful tool. Mm -hmm. And my responsibility tonight is to talk to you about biblical perspectives on missions. And when Jeff was introducing WEC, I should just fill a little bit of, bit of a gap because uh, after C.T. Studd died, Norman Grubb, who followed him as the international leader of WEC, he trusted the Lord for 10 new missionaries as a memorial to the life and ministry of C.T. Studd. And in WEC circles, my wife's mother was number nine, and my wife's father was number 10. Mm. So my wife actually and her sister and uh, they grew up in the Congo. So mm. I, I married into WEC. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit of WEC history as well. But I joined WEC in 1964. And my wife saying that she joined in 1972. <laughs> uh, I had seven years in Taiwan, unmarried. Then I came home. We got married. Uh, we had a year off from ministry for a while. And then we started a hostel for international students. We did that for a few years. Then God very clearly directed us to Singapore and the calling that we had was to recruit non-European missionaries for the rest of the world. Then from Singapore, we moved to Australia for two years in Melbourne. I pastored a Chinese church. And then we were called to teach in our missionary training college in Tasmania, Australia. So we taught there for 12 years. Then we were called to New Zealand to be the directors for WEC in New Zealand. And then uh, after six years in that role, I reached the age of 65. And in our system, when you turn 65 and you're in leadership, you can continue in leadership and be reviewed every 12 months, or you can step away from the leadership and continue in ministry. So we stepped away from the leadership and we've continued in ministry until today. We're still active and believe it or not, I'm 79. So our whole vision uh, for virtually all our missionary life has been to recruit new missionaries and to see them going to the furthest parts of the earth. So that's a little bit of my story, but what I want to do now is just take you through a PowerPoint uh, demonstration and introduce you to the biblical basis for mission. All right, so there it is. Then, uh, let me just, okay. So, the biblical basis for mission, of course, will always have to be found in the Bible. And like any good book, there's a beginning and there's an end. And between those two places is the story and all the events that bring us to the conclusion of the story. So mission begins in Genesis and will end in the book of Revelation. And so there is a continuous thread revealing the sovereignty and the love of God. God is the initiator. 
He is the one who looks for Adam and Eve after the fall. God is the one who calls Abram to leave Ur and by faith move on to a land that God was going to show to Abraham and his descendants. They are the recipients of God's promises. And God also is the one who speaks to Moses at the burning bush. So there's a lot going on in those early beginnings and in the early chapters of scripture. So in the beginning, God's creation was good. In fact, God said what he had made was very good. So we have to understand that in the beginning, everything that God made was very good. And then, unfortunately, something went wrong. Adam and Eve in the garden, in that beautiful creation, disobeyed God. God had told them that everything in the garden except one tree was there for them, but that one tree was forbidden. And you know the story. And so uh, Eve was tempted. She introduced some of that temptation to Adam. He went along with it. And the ongoing impact of all of that disobedience is well described in the book of Romans. And in Romans, here it comes. Through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. And we're all theological students, you know all this. And then again in Romans, because of Adam's sin, death spread to all men. And all men became sinners. And so at that point, a few years on, God looks at what's happened. He looks at the state of the human race at that point, and he declares his regret that he had even made the human race. And so in Genesis chapter 6, verse 17, he declares his intention to destroy the earth and the heavens. And as he's working towards that end, he, he, he sees one man, Noah, a righteous man. And because of Noah's righteousness, Noah was accepted by God who makes a covenant with Noah. And the outcome of all of that is that Noah and his family are saved. So not all creation was destroyed. Not all of humanity was destroyed. But God, at that point, after the flood, he gave a directive to Noah and to his family that they be fruitful and increase in number. The instruction to them was multiply on the earth. And in that context, spread around over the earth. But they hadn't obeyed that command. And so in Genesis 11, 4, we understand the world population had increased. But instead of spreading over the whole earth, they stayed focused in one place. There was just one language and all these people were happy to live as a community. It was a communal wish to stay together rather than be scattered. So what happens? How does God respond to this worldwide display of pride and disobedience? And you know the story. They decide to build a tower. They build it high. Now, we can imagine many things. God, after the flood, made a covenant 
with Noah and he sealed the covenant by putting a rainbow in the sky. And the message of the rainbow was that God would never cause such a great flood to happen again. But now we've got a community, a huge population of people, and they're building a tower that they hope will reach to the heavens. Now, it's possible that what they were trying to build was something so tall that if there was a flood, they would be safe because they'd built it so high. The problem with that is that it's a demonstration, if that's a reasonable supposition, it suggests that what God had promised, they did not believe. And so they decided they would build this tower, they would reach up to the heavens, and they would be recognized as a significant community. But that's not what God wanted. And so God responds to this whole world display of pride and disobedience in what way? He He comes and he destroys that big building and he scatters the people across the whole earth. And in the scattering, he divided the scattering of people into different language groups. And what happens even today, people go overseas and uh, we gravitate to people who speak our language, uh, just in terms of fellowship and stuff like that. So here is a huge community of people scattered across the earth and having to relate to people that they couldn't understand. So there's a, a movement of people to find somebody who speaks the same language. So there we have God's response. And because of that, there are, this is a, a chart or whatever of the spread of languages around the world. And at the same time, when languages were made so multiple, we also have the beginnings of culture. And culture is so widespread and culture covers many things. And so God changed the languages and he introduced culture. And following all of this, we understand from scripture that God's desire for all of mankind is that they be blessed. And he introduces early in the scriptures, a man called Abram or Abraham and his descendants. And there are times when in the Old Testament, the focus is more on Israel. But as we go through from now on, we will also observe that God is interested in Israel, but his heart is bigger than just one community of people. His heart is for the whole world. And so he introduces Abraham. And what he's saying in that introduction is that at some point, there will be a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language group, standing before the throne and before the Lord. Now, that's God's heart. So very early in the scriptures, God is revealing his heart for more than Israel. His heart is for the whole world. And so he introduces Abraham. Now, the story of Abraham is an interesting story because it demonstrates the sovereignty of God. Of all the people around, God could have chosen anybody, but in his sovereignty, he decided that Abraham was going to be his choice. And so he chooses Abraham. And what does he say to Abraham? Leave your country, leave your people, 
leave your father's household and go to the land I will show you. So that's a big ask. And Abraham, being the man he was, had no hesitation to obey that voice, to obey that command. And so the scriptures record that God speaks to Abraham three times in relation to that covenant that he'd made with him. And, and there are particular references to all the nations of the earth being blessed through Abraham and his descendants. And there's the references. Genesis 12, 1 to 3, 18, 17 to 19, and 22, 1 to 18. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that. In the, these studies and in this presentation, uh, we're introduced to what the perspectives on world mission, uh, that's a whole study program uh, that runs internationally, but they talk about this top line blessing. And for Abraham, this was the top line blessing. I will make you a single man or a married man at that point too. I will make you into a great nation. So out of one couple is going to come a multitude of people. Then part of that top line blessing is that Abraham will be blessed. Another blessing, his name will be great. And he will be a blessing. And so we have to understand that when God blesses us, it's not just for me. When God blesses me, he does it so that somewhere down the line, I can be a blessing to somebody else. So a top line blessing is a blessing promising or making an offer to an individual or a command to a community or a nation. But with that blessing comes responsibility. And we have to recognize that the heart of God is for the whole world. And my understanding is that uh, on a regular basis, God calls men and women to move, as Abraham did, from his country to another country. And uh, that's the vision that I've always had in my missionary career. And then in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, there's what these perspective people call the bottom line blessing. And that means that I will bless those who bless you. All the people on earth will be blessed through you. And in all of those blessing uh, commentaries, there's one negative word. And that word is, I will curse whoever curses you. A bottom line blessing requires a responsibility and an action related to passing that blessing on to others. So when God blesses us, it's not just that we can hold it to ourselves, but we have to believe that God will direct us to bless somebody else. And Abraham is a man of huge, huge faith. In Hebrews 11, verse 17 to 20, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. The man who'd embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And so Abraham dared to believe that what God had promised earlier was still going to happen. And now God is saying, I want you to take your son and sacrifice him. And Abraham didn't step back. He had enough faith to believe that even if he killed his son, God would somehow intervene and raise him up. And God recognized that faith and honored Abraham because of it. 
there in Genesis 26, 1 to 5. Isaac receives from God the same covenant, covenant and the same covenant again applies to Jacob in chapter 28, 10 to 15. And in each case, the multitude is described in different ways. So in one case, the descendants were going to be more than the stars in the heaven. In another case, the descendants were going to be more than the sand on the seashore. And in another case, the descendants were going to be more than the dust in a dust storm. Now, the significance of those three illustrations is the numbers are going to be so huge that they're going to be impossible to count. And today, the scientists, they keep looking around in the stars and they keep finding more and more galaxies. And there's never going to be anyone who's going to number those stars. You go to the beach. You count the sand. Well, you get just one small bucket and you'll, you'll give up. But there's a whole beach of sand and then dust. And the, the marvelous thing about dust is that it permeates everything. If it didn't, we wouldn't have to sweep our houses. If it didn't, we wouldn't have to run around and clean the dust off stuff. But dust permeates. And this is what God is saying, that his love for the world and this gospel that we'll be introduced to is going to spread and it's going to permeate the whole world. And that's a huge encouragement for all of us today. And so, as we move on, let me... So in the Old Testament, we have this wonderful word of prophecy in the book of Isaiah. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to so many people, to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. He sent me to proclaim good news to the captives and release from the darkness for prisoners. Now, that's a huge promise. And it's a foretaste. It's a, it's a, a prophecy, really in relation to the coming of Jesus. And there are many Old Testament passages that talk about the coming of Jesus. This is one of uh, the most significant ones. But how does that relate? Here it comes in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. Jesus comes out of the wilderness. Now, he's taken, he's driven into the wilderness, the Gospels tell us he was driven into the wilderness by Satan. He goes into the wilderness. He's tempted for 40 days. The devil offers him so many things. And every time something is offered, Jesus rebukes that offer on the basis of what is written as an alternative to what Satan is offering. And at the end of those temptations, the devil departs. And then it says that Jesus came out of all of that in the power of the spirit. And the first place he went to was to the temple. And the first thing he did, he picked up the Isaiah scroll. He unround, unrolled it and he began to read. And this is what he read. The Isaiah prophecy, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. To set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, he didn't finish everything. He, he missed out a little bit. And the interesting thing is that as he returned the scroll... The people listening were so impressed. They almost cheered. They clapped. They were, they were 
overwhelmed with his capacity to speak. But as he read this, their happiness and their joy turned to frustration and anger. And they came against him and they were trying desperately to throw him over the cliff. And Jesus demonstrated his power by walking through the crowd. But why did they get so angry? They got angry because the peace that he missed out was one about judgment. And these people would have been happy if he talked about the judgment, but he didn't. And that's why they got so angry. So, yeah, so when Jesus came out of that uh, wilderness experience, he was led out by the Holy Spirit. In the wilderness. In, he was led into the, into the wilderness and he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. So now we're going to look at some of the people in the Old Testament that were very specially blessed, but they weren't Jewish. And we find the first one in 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 10 and 11. Now, when Jesus is talking to the crowd in the temple, he uses this illustration. Yet Elijah was not sent. Now, they all knew Elijah was a prophet. Elijah the prophet was not sent to any of them, but only to one woman, a widow in Zarephath. Now, she was not a Jewish woman. She was a Gentile. And yet, in the Old Testament, God is demonstrating that, sure, he has a love for his people Israel, but his heart is so big that it can encompass a non-Jewish woman who, by taking in the prophet Elijah, is blessed by having him come into her house. And then the blessing goes on. And uh, she comes to the conclusion at the end of uh, a period of time that everything that Elijah says and has said to her is truth because she recognizes that he is a prophet sent from God. This is a Gentile lady. And we need to recognize that God moves in the hearts of Gentiles still today. Then in the same context, he says, in Elijah's day, the prophet Elijah, there were many lepers. Hordes of people had leprosy. But Elijah only went to one man. And that man was not a Jew. He wasn't a Jewish person. He was a Gentile. He was a very famous military general. And he was stuck he was caught up with the problem of leprosy and a slave girl a jewish slave girl suggested uh, that he ask elijah for help and when elijah told him how he could be healed he didn't want to do it and then his own advisors said look what he's asking you to do is not that difficult just dip in the river and so he did. And what happened? He was healed, a Gentile. So again, we see and we recognize that God is willing and more than able to speak into the hearts of non-Jewish people. Then you've got the story of Daniel. Now, he was Jewish. But he was in a non-Jewish environment. He was in a Gentile environment. And there was a lot of jealousy. And people uh, told lies about him. And so the king uh, gave orders that Daniel, on the basis of these lies, should be thrown into the lion's den. And he was, he was very hesitant. He didn't really want to do it. But he couldn't go against the advice of the people 
around him. And so he said, okay, throw him in with the lions. But he did have a word of encouragement for Daniel. And he says, may your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. So even though he was thrown to the throwing him to the lions, he was hoping madly that something good would happen. And then what did happen? God shut the lion's mouth. The king came the next day and told them to take the stone away and whatever, and they looked in, and there was Daniel unharmed. And he was so impressed. This is a Gentile king. He was so impressed. King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth. And his message to them is one, may you prosper greatly. But then he says, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Why? Because he's the living God. He endures forever and will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He saves, he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And so here again is God demonstrating his power. He's demonstrating his love and his ability to speak through someone like Daniel in a miracle into the heart and life of a man who was a Gentile king. And then you know all about Jonah. Uh, we won't have to go into too much detail there. But God spoke to a Jewish man and told him that he was to go to a Gentile city, thousands of people, and he was to call them to repentance. And he didn't want to go. Why? Because these were Gentile people. He didn't want to go there. And there's a whole series of events and then finally Jonah becomes willing and so he goes to Nineveh and he preaches and he calls this, the whole city to repent and they did and they did and their whole relationship with God changed and so these are Gentiles in the Old Testament coming to a faith and some sort of understanding of God and then in the book of Micah, in chapter 4, 1 and 2, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established, I think, as the highest of the mountain, on the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills. People will stream to it, and many nations will come and say, come. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord will go from Jerusalem. But these people are coming from all nations and they're hearing and they're wanting to hear the things about God. And then... We come into the New Testament. And this passage of scripture here, Luke 24, verses 25 to 27. Now, this is Jesus on the Emmaus Road. He's walking along that road with two people. And as they walk, he begins to open the scriptures. And I, I think personally that this is probably one of the most profound Bible studies that anybody could ever have attended. Here is Jesus opening the scriptures. He talks from the Pentateuch. He talks from the Psalms. He talks from the prophets. And he tells them in however long it takes to walk seven miles, he tells them how all of these passages of scripture are connected to him. And then he says to them, oh, foolish people, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. It was necessary that the Christ should 
suffer all of these things and so that he could enter into his glory. And beginning with the Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the scriptures about the things concerning himself. So now we have Jesus coming onto the scene. Now, we might, let me think. Uh, I'll just take you to Exodus 3, verse 7, 8. This is a wonderful passage in the Old Testament as well. And then we'll take this few minute break. But in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, God appears to Moses and he's speaking primarily to his own people, the Jewish people or about them. But he says, I have seen their misery. I've heard their cry. I am concerned. And then he says, I'm so concerned I'm coming down to do what? To rescue them and to bring them out of their captivity. Now, this is God speaking about his own people. But God's heart is bigger than his own people. And so he looks at an unconverted world and he sees the misery. He hears cries for help. He says, I see it, I hear it. I am concerned. In fact, I will come down and rescue them and bring them out. And in that period of time, Moses was his servant. Moses was his instrument. Now, we're coming into the New Testament. Jesus has come. Why? Because God saw the misery in the world. He heard the cry for help. He demonstrated his concern. He comes down in the person of Jesus. To do what? To rescue them and to bring them out. And Moses was his instrument. Now, who are his instruments for ministering to people in desperate need? And we'll talk about that in the next round. So it's my clock tells me it's quarter to six here in New Zealand. I don't know what time it is where you are, but we'll take a break and then we'll come back. All right. Okay, so we'll come back in about 10 minutes. So it's, um, it's 2.46 uh, at the moment. So I'll come back at 2.55 shop. Then, okay. then we'll start. Have a good Wonderful. break. Okay, Thanks. thank you. See you soon. Okay. The prayer. Yeah. Okay. Lord Jesus, we do come and we do say thank you for who you are and for the greatness and the just the magnitude of your love for everything that you created. Lord, uh, we thank you that you look down on a fallen world and mm -hmm. Lord, you heard the cries for help. You showed your concern by sending Jesus and Lord, you have through him come and Lord, opened a door for the releasing of captives and the setting free of uh, people in deep mourning and sorrow. And Lord, we thank you that that's still applicable today. And so as we continue in this session, Lord, come, Holy Spirit, and as you did on the road to Emmaus, Lord, just open our eyes, open our minds, open our understanding, and Lord, speak to us in terms of the world around us and our responsibility for it in Jesus name. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, so again, the magnitude of God's love and you know this verse so well. Uh, John 3 16 for God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send him into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him so again this is the magnitude 
of God's love for every one of us and for the world at large. So that's the good news. Uh, okay, now, when we come to the life and ministry of Jesus, there are several New Testament examples of Jesus showing concern for non-Jews as well as Jews. So one of the first ones, Luke 7, 1 to 10, Jesus and the centurion, centurion servant. Now, the centurion commanded a lot of respect, not just because he was a centurion, but because he treated his servants well. And when his servant gets sick, he's concerned and he's looking around for somebody that might be able to help. And he comes to Jesus. And so he pleads a case for Jesus to heal this servant. And what happens? Jesus marvels at the level of this Roman centurion's faith. And he, he says to the crowd looking on, he said, I haven't seen faith like this in Israel before. This is a Roman, but look, he's got more faith than all of you. And so he speaks that word of healing and the guy's servant is healed. But he's not Jewish, he's a Roman. And uh, again, we see Jesus demonstrating the heart of God for a community of people that are not Jewish. So we, we take note of that. And then you've got the Samaritan woman at the well. And you're studying theology. I'm sure you've looked at all of this. But this woman is drawing water in the middle of the day. And there's a reason for that. Uh, most of the women would come for water in the evening when it's cooler. But for this lady, her her background and her lifestyle uh, was a bit suspicious. So she came in the midday, in the middle of the heat. And then Jesus is sitting there, and this woman is a Samaritan. And normally, Jews and Samaritans didn't communicate. And yet... Here is Jesus talking to this lady and he demonstrates and he shows her how much he understands and how much he knows about her life and her lifestyle and her history and all the, all the gory details he, he's uh, familiar with. And she runs back to her village and she's, encourages people to come out and meet this man who's told her everything about her history and her life. And so they come and they listen and they respond to Jesus, not because of her story, but because of what Jesus is saying to them. And this is a Samaritan village and Jesus is sharing the gospel, not just with a Samaritan woman of perhaps ill repute, but he's sharing with her neighborhood and demonstrating and speaking so positively that people are responding. And this is all to a Samaritan village. So again, they're not Jewish. And then we get the story of, of the 10 lepers. Now, Probably nine of them were Jewish. They got healed. One of them was a Samaritan. He got healed. But only one came back to say thank you to Jesus. And it wasn't the Jewish community. The nine Jews, perhaps, that were healed, they were just over, overwhelmed with joy at being healed, but they, they weren't interested in thanking Jesus. But this fellow, a Samaritan comes back to say thank you to Jesus. And again, this is a, a demonstration in the midst of a Jewish society of the magnitude and the greatness of not just Jesus' heart, but the heart of God into the lives of 
non-Jewish people. And then we have this one here, the faith of a Canaanite woman. Now, this poor woman, she comes to Jesus. She's got a problem. Her young daughter is what she calls demon-possessed. And she's begging for help. Now, Jesus, on the surface, seems to be very blunt. And he basically says, no, 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 it's not your turn. I'm busy. I'm come, and I have come for my own people, for the Jewish people. You're not a Jew, so I'm very sorry. But this woman demonstrates great faith. And Jesus, you know, he's talking about uh, the bread and uh, just how things are spread out on the table. And then this lady, a, a Gentile woman, she demonstrates a huge amount of faith. And she says to Jesus, okay, dogs. Well, in Jewish society, dogs and Samaritans were the lowest of the low. And so she says, yeah, but even the dogs, you know, when all these people are feasting and whatever, a few crumbs drop down on the ground and the dogs are free to eat them. And she's saying to the Lord in one sense, I might be a Gentile. I might, in our society or the society around me, I might be like a dog. But even for the dogs, there are a few crumbs. And what I'm asking for is just a crumb for my daughter's safety and future. And Jesus was so impressed with her faith that he spoke that word of healing and the woman and the daughter went home rejoicing. Again, not a Jewish woman, but the heart of God, the heart of Jesus are moved by the need of Jews, but also the need of a non-Jewish community. And so he heals the woman because she demonstrates faith. So this verse here, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world, the whole world. And there's no gaps anywhere there, the whole world. Matthew 28, uh, and you know this, I'm sure, from your studies, but this is what we call the Great Commission. And Jesus says that he has all, all, not just little bits, he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the end of the age. Now, this is where we in today's society pick up this kind of challenge. It's addressed not just to 12 disciples. It's addressed to us as well. And this is our brief. This is what we're responsible for doing. So here comes the mission. And the mission is to preach the gospel to all nations. And then this verse in chapter 1 of 1 and verse 8 in Acts. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay, now... Jerusalem and Judea are basically the same background. The people in Samaria, their cultural background is similar, not exactly the same, but not wildly different. But to the ends of the earth, the cultural background is totally different. And so this is God's challenge. And so to some of us, we're called to a ministry pretty well much to our own culture. To some of us, we're called to a ministry to a culture that is similar to ours. And then some of us 
are called to a culture that's totally different. Now, I come from New Zealand. So in New Zealand, our primary language is English. I had to go from New Zealand to Taiwan to study Chinese. Now, when I was at language school, at least in Bible college, my Bible college principal also taught linguistics. And he spoke to me uh, after my graduation and he said, Morris, uh, I don't think you should even think about Chinese ministry. He said, you are the only student I have had who has done my linguistics course twice and failed twice. And my problem is, of course, or well, not of course, but my problem is that I'm tone deaf. And Mandarin Chinese has four recognizable tones and a neutral tone. And my ear doesn't pick them up. So my Bible college principal was trying to be very, very kind and tell me that, you know, uh, you should think of an English speaking ministry. But I knew in my heart that God had called me to Chinese ministry. So I studied Chinese for two years, nearly two years. And in God's wisdom, I taught and I preached in Chinese. I, I was in Taiwan seven years, so five of those years were in ministry. But how God did it was really very interesting because the way I teach is what they call expository preaching, verse by verse by verse. And so when I preached, as long as I knew the text and as long as the people in the congregation had a Chinese Bible and were following the text, I could I could teach. And if I made mistakes, the people in the congregation had the text and they knew what I meant to say. And so for five years, I taught Chinese Bible uh, because of the gift that God gave me in exposition. So I went from an English speaking culture, cultural language and cultural uh, practice background to something totally different. And God blessed me and God encouraged me. I went from eating with a knife and, knife and fork to eating with chopsticks. Wow, uh, very tricky stuff. Uh, when I was in the language school, my language teachers, they said to me, if you stay in Chinese ministry long enough, you will change the whole language. <laughs> and why they said that, in New Zealand, we have an expression, we say, no sweat, no perspiration. And in our culture, if you say that, that means it's easy, it's not a problem. And so I thought, well, in Chinese, they have a word for no, and they have a word for perspiration. So I put those two words together, and I would say to Chinese friends, it's easy, you know, meo chu han. And they would want me to explain that. And then I would say, well, it means it's easy, no sweat. And so Chinese friends began to use that combination, Mayo Chu Han. And uh, it, it's just me being silly, but it, it's one of those cultural changes that I had to struggle with. And I would never get a prize for uh, perfect Mandarin, but I had Mandarin to a level with, that people could understand and God blessed that over the years. So these are the instructions, these are the commands that God gives. Now, in Romans chapter, whoop, in 
Yeah. Romans 10, 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on the one they've never believed in? How can they be sent? No, how can they? I can't quite read the text there because of my face and your faces are blocking it out. But anyway, you'll know that verse. How can they preach and how can they be sent? Only God can give that anointing. Only God can put that call on somebody's life. So here's the commission. Now, Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 to 6. Now, when I was called to the ministry as a missionary, this is the passage of scripture that God used to call me into the mission field. Isaiah 49, 1 to 6. And I'll just go through it quickly. Uh, when you have a spare moment, you could go through it on your own. But I've divided the verses up. And so initially, the audience is to the islands and the distant places of the earth. The calling is from the Lord himself. And the timing of that call is even before I was born. God was already working. God was already setting the stage for whatever I was going to do. And whatever you're going to do, God has already planned and programmed it. And you have to just be aware of what God is saying to you. And so the preparation, he made my mouth like a sharpened sword and made me into an arrow, a sharp arrow. Now you're training in seminary. This is part of your seminary training. You're going to learn to preach. He's going to make your mouth like a sharp sword. He's going to make your ministry like a sharp arrow. And it's going to be effective because God is shaping your life and your future while you're in seminary. Then he talks about the protection. He's concealed in his quiver and the shadow of his hand. That's God's protection. God protects us in his quiver. You know what a quiver is? It's that kind of little bag or a hollow bamboo tube that you hang over your shoulder and it's full of arrows. And when you're aiming your bow, you just reach over and get an arrow and loaded in the bow and you fire it. And so the arrows are kept in the quiver until God is ready to fire them out. And you're in the shadow of his hand and God's hand is a very powerful, it's a very big hand. And you're in the shadow of that hand. And the message is for my servant. For what end? For the display of my splendor. Now, when you read passages like Isaiah 49, some of it is addressed to a historical situation. Some of it has almost a prophetic influence. And in this case, a little bit of both, because there's a messianic challenge in all of this. And so there's a verse four, it talks about the frustration. I've labored in vain, my strength is spent for nothing. And sometimes in ministry, we feel like that. Sometimes in missionary work, people labor for years and they see very little fruit and they, they get discouraged. But after they've gone, then somebody else comes or after they've gone, nobody comes. But the Spirit of God takes the seed and multiplies it. And so there's all of this unfolding. And so I want to encourage you in terms of discouragement, and you will get discouraged sometimes. Know this, that God sees everything that's going on. And what does he say? There's confidence. And the, the writer here says, my due is in God's hands and my reward is with him. And so 
when you're discouraged, read passages like this because they really are an encouragement. The original vision was to my servant to do what? To restore situations, to bring back people who've maybe backslidden or whatever else. And then the bigger picture, this original vision is limited. The bigger picture is that these people would ultimately be a light to the ends of the earth for his salvation. Now, this is the bigger picture. And as we go through the next few verses and pictures, what we learn is that the God's intention was that the world would be evangelized by the Jewish community. But when we read Paul and some of his writing, the challenge was given to that community, but they rejected it. They said, no, no, we don't want to do anything in relation to Gentiles. And so Paul says, okay, Barnabas will do this, but I, I'm moving on. I'm going to reach out to the Gentiles. And that's where Paul becomes a apostle to the Gentiles. And so even way back there in the book of Isaiah, it's all unfolding in the New Testament. And this is Paul speaking in Acts 15. The, the word of the Lord came to you first, but since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles for this is what the Lord has commanded us. And what's he quoting? He's quoting from Isaiah 49. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So this is Paul quoting Isaiah 49 into another context and another time frame. And it applies and it works still today. So... The Apostle Paul was transformed because of his encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road. From being a zealous persecutor of the fledging, fledg, fledgling church, he becomes the Apostle to the Gentiles. And in Galatians chapter 2, 7 and 8, Paul writing, on the contrary, they recognize, this is the leadership, that I, Paul, have been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised or the Gentiles, just as Peter has been set aside for the circumcised or for the Jews. For God was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised and also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. So this intention that the Jews would evangelize the world didn't happen. The Jews rejected that thought. And so Peter moves into a ministry in one direction and Paul has an anointing to move in another direction. And so the gospel continues to spread and Gentiles are continually being added into God's kingdom. Now, this is a great verse in Galatians 3. So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now, I don't know if you've understood this or realized this before, but here it comes. Those who have faith are children of Abraham. Now, you, believe it or not, are a child of Abraham. And the promises that God gave to Abraham are as applicable to Abraham and his descendants as they are now to you and God wants to bless you so that you can bless others and that's what Abraham did and that's what God is hoping and looking for 
from us. And then in this verse, Colossians 1, 5, and 6, the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, this gospel, the gospel, is bearing fruit and growing throughout the world. Now, that's the world in those days. But believe it or not, I think still, this same simple gospel is still growing. Maybe not in our Western world. I think in our Western world, it's a bit shaky. But in your world, the gospel is still growing. And my vision and my passion is that men and women like yourselves pick up the mantle of going to the uttermost parts of the earth and be God's instruments for changing the world. And that map there, you'll understand that. That's the 1040 window. And then that red oblong block there are some of the poorest, some of the most unreached countries in the world. And this is, in one sense, the last stepping stone to reaching the world. Now, Romans 15, I'm trying to go through this quickly, but uh, this is one of the sermons that I've preached over uh, quite a few years to many conferences. And I believe, from my point of view, that these verses are the most powerful missions challenge in the whole of scripture. This is Paul. And I'd go through it very quickly, but uh, if you want notes that are more extended than these, talk to Jeff and I can send uh, more detailed notes to you. But in Romans 15, verse 14, this is Paul's conviction. And his conviction is this, that he believes that his Christian brothers and sisters are full of goodness, mature in knowledge, and competent to instruct others. Now, you're all studying in seminary. And by the time you graduate, this should be the outcome of whatever number of years you've been in training. You should come out of that seminary full of goodness. You should come out mature in knowledge. Knowledge of what? It's not knowledge of what, it's knowledge of who. Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit. And at the end of it all, you'll come out and you'll be competent to teach and to instruct others. So while you're in seminary, soak up all that's going. Make it your own. Because in the future, those lessons you will learn and be able to apply into the lives of others. And then in verse 16, Paul's awareness, he's aware of God's grace. He's aware that he's called to be a minister of Christ Jesus. And he's fully aware that his sphere of ministry is to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish world. He knew all that. And then he has a God-given responsibility. And he takes it willingly. He has a priestly duty. Now, duty is a, is a powerful word. And so he takes this priestly duty. And what is it? To proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. And the purpose of proclaiming all that. This is God's purpose. That Gentiles become acceptable to a holy God. Well, Gentiles can only be acceptable. Jews can only be acceptable through Jesus. And here it is. And Gentiles will become sanctified by the ministry of the Spirit. And lives will be changed. Gentile lives, Jewish lives, can only be changed by the power of God's Spirit. And then Paul's attitude. He's glorying in Christ Jesus in his service to God. He gets up in the morning and he thinks to himself, another day, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to serve the kingdom. And he goes out and he's faithful to his ministry. He's not moaning and groaning. He has this level of humility in verse 18. 
And he says, when I talk about my ministry, I'm not going to say anything about what I have done. I'm going to only speak about the things that Christ has done through me. And when he takes that position and he talks about the things that Jesus has done, Gentiles come to Jesus, come to God through faith. And then how does he do it? And in verse 19, he does it through the things that he says and does. But those two things go in harmony. What he says and what he does are in total sync with the will and purpose of God. And some of that doing is through the power of signs and wonders. And so mm -hmm. in his own ministry, he talks about the scope of his ministry. And he says, I've run out of things to do. I've been everywhere. And then as an afterthought almost, he thinks and he talks about maybe one day he will take the gospel to Spain. That's in the future. But while he's still active, he's finding things to do. And it's not always in the uttermost parts of the earth. He found things to do closer to home. But he was faithful in the big things and the little things. And we have to be like that too. And this is Paul's ambition. Now, I don't know what your ambition is. In our Western world, people have ambitions to be millionaires, to uh, have a church of a million people. Uh, we get ideas of great ambition. But Paul's ambition was this, to preach the gospel where Christ was never heard, never known. His ambition was not to build on someone else's foundation. And then in those last, or there's 23 to 29, Paul's plans. He plans to visit Jerusalem. He plans to visit Rome. And maybe he's got Spain in his mind as well. And then he has this final kind of uh, forward thinking. And in verse 24, he said, when I come and visit, I'm going to come and we're going to have some fellowship together. I'm going to come and I'm going to look for some assistance. And he's going to ask for prayer and he's looking for refreshing. And when missionaries come home on furlough and home leave and when you have a sabbatical or whatever else, these are the things that you'll be looking for. Fellowship, encouragement, assistance if you're a thinking of international ministry. You're looking for people to pray for you and to support you. And when you come home from those journeys, you're looking to be refreshed and encouraged. And Paul knew, knew all that. And that was part of his calling and part of his ministry. So it's this wonderful verse here in Isaiah 119. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the earth. But if you resist and rebel, and what comes after that is a very negative outcome. The positive outcome is willingness and obedience. Yeah, we're willing for many things. But sometimes the obedience for the things that God asks of us is not quite so strong. The two things go together. And when God says, do this, we have to put our hand up and say, yes, like Isaiah, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. That's the willingness. The obedience is packing a suitcase and getting on with it. And these are powerful verses. And these are verses that have meant so much in my ministry and in my life. And one final verse, John 13, 13. Now we're talking mission, we're talking ministry, we're talking service for the king. And this is what Jesus says. You call me teacher and Lord, 
and so I am. That's what I am. Now, this is Jesus' reply. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. Set an example so that you should do to others as it's been done to you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant's greater than his master, nor the messenger greater than the one who sent him. But what I'd like you to focus on, and your theological students, I've looked at this little verse here. You call me teacher and Lord. That's a human response. Teacher and Lord. Now, when Jesus replies, for whatever reason, he changes the order. And he says, you call me teacher and Lord. That's good. That's what I am. But now I'm saying, I am your Lord and teacher. Now, what's more significant? The teacher or the Lord? And Jesus, I think, my understanding is that Jesus puts the Lordship of Christ ahead of his teaching ability. And we need to follow that that order you're in a seminary and uh, it's very easy to see jesus as a great teacher but when you're out serving the lord the teaching element is subject to the whole thing of jesus being lord of our life and our decision making and whatever else and if we can get that order in the correct place, we do the kingdom of God and ourselves a great favor. And finally, this is the end. The whole point of mission, the whole point of the biblical basis of mission is that every nation, every tongue, every tribe should have a representation in the kingdom of heaven. And you and I, can be part of that program. You and I can hear the word and the law and the whisper of the Holy Spirit. And if he's saying you can do this, then willing, that's good. Obedience is better. Thank you. And God bless you.